Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and welcome to Africa is a potential solution to supplying demand for rare earth elements to drive sustainable global renewable energy production. We're delighted to welcome you here. And before we start, uh, let me welcome to the stage and take uh, our seats, please, Mr. Chris Wilmot, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Glory Inf Infrastructure Incorporated. If you would come now, uh, Felix, uh, Antonio Tichetti, Tecumbo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo will be heard in a moment. Uh, Mr. Brad Crabtree, Crabtree, Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Tom, Thomas A. Lagrasso, a Director of Critical Minerals Institute, Department of Energy. Dr. Panwi Gibson, President of Egotech. We have another panelist. From the from the uh, State Department. Just have them come out. I will introduce them in a moment. And you get this dinner seat here. Yes. It's a pleasure. Yeah, wonderful to see Thank you so very much. We will we will Yes. You, you're in the middle there, and you're just right, right there on the side, right over there. There you go. Thank you. I think we have everyone, and I will appropriately um, introduce all of our guests. But we are now going to have an opening video. We're now going to have an opening video, uh, and I will then call our wonderful sponsor uh, from API in just a moment. Thank you so very much. Will the video please run? I want to make sure that I introduce the ambassador correctly. And so I want to make sure that uh, having seen him before and seeing him now uh, to welcome the former ambassador uh, to Ukraine and Greece, but now the Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Energy Resources in the State Department, Jeffrey Pyatt. Uh, and uh, we'll soon introduce another outstanding member of the State Department in just, in just a minute. Um, Thank you so very much. Mr. Masinga, Principal Deputy Assistant for uh, the um, African Affairs Bureau, and we're delighted to have you, Irvin Masinga. We're even more delighted to have our friends uh, who have worked with us over the years, uh, and as they have worked, I think they've now come to all of the above, but they're working 
uh, to spread a very positive message about how we uh, work together uh, for the betterment of our future with energy across the disciplines. And I'm very delighted to have Amanda Eversall representing API as she brings uh, their greetings uh, and their reflections on how best we serve not only the nation, but the world. We're delighted to have you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Your leadership on these important issues is much appreciated, and you help us all get stronger and be better as a country, as a nation, and as a globe, so thank you for that. Um, we're excited to be here. We're excited to sponsor this session here. The American, Pro, uh, the American Petroleum Institute, of course, has been leading a proactive approach to advance a diverse and resilient supply chain as well as workforce. We have programs uh, to ensure that our industry reflects not only the vibrant communities that we represent, but we also um, aspire to continue to deliver a better energy future for all. Of course, the world is learning very quickly that energy is not something that we can take for granted. Uh, of course, those of you on this panel know that all too well. Uh, you can see it every day with what's happening particularly in Europe, uh, the rationing, the price caps, every industries and factories that are dependent on uh, high energy use are closing and developing contingency plans. And of course, some European companies are paying already 10 times what they paid for their energy bills in 2021. Uh, beyond the economic questions, there are national security questions, of course, Russia's leverage over Europe, um, and of course, the ability of uh, natural gas to reach homes for heating, hospitals, and other places as the cold winter approaches. If countries working against our own interests can uh, control your energy supplies, what control do you, do you ultimately have? And we don't want to end up like that here in America or anywhere else in the world, of course. Um, and that's why we need the perspective of energy to inform the all of the above approach, as the, con as the Congresswoman said. More broadly, the big picture, the world's population, of course, is going to continue to increase by 2 billion people in between now and 2050. And demand for all energy is expected to go up, including oil and gas. So we're going to need it. And with that in mind, API and our member companies are making the pitch to all Americans that we can figure out this dual challenge, figure out how to produce affordable and reliable energy while reducing emissions at the same time. So we are leading the way at, um, in terms of developing research, in, ter in terms of figuring out ways to produce lower emitting and lower carbon uh, fuels and creating a better world for all of us. So um, at this time, I just want to say that uh, the United States of America is a, has emerged as a top uh, producer of oil and gas. We are confident that we're going to meet this dual challenge um, and that we look forward to serving as a model for the rest of the world. We appreciate your time. We appreciate the ability to be part of this conversation. And thank you much for your leadership. Thank you. Amanda, we've been doing this for over two decades and we're very grateful for your presence here today. Um, I think it is important with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation but also uh, its representation of the nation and representation of close to 60 members that we have a wide view, uh, one that recognizes all the challenges that we face and that we have a wide view of our friends and collaborators so that we can all walk in the same pathway uh, for the edifying and the betterment of our message, but also the deeds. And that is creating an energy platform uh, that will be helpful to everyone. So thank you so very much for uh, that outstanding uh, offer of welcome, and we appreciate it as well. So let me, as uh, we begin, uh, acknowledge uh, the Houstonians that are in the room. We're so delighted that you're here. This is streaming, um, and we're even more delighted uh, that we have that uh, opportunity, and I want to acknowledge the Congressional Black Caucus and the foundation, of which I served as a former chair, uh, and so I know the hard work that has gone into this session and to welcome you in the first session since the pandemic. Uh, so um, we're excited about being here and about the information that we're going to give today and also our very special guest that you will hear by video. And so let me um, start my remarks uh, by acknowledging, uh, for those of you who are not aware, I come from Houston, Texas. I represent the 18th Congressional District. 
Uh, and um, we have some exciting uh, crosswinds in Texas and in Houston. Uh, and since uh, I am in a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and this Energy Brain Trust that is almost 30 years old, in fact, uh, my dear friend and late colleague, uh, the Honorable Mickey Leland, uh, thought well enough to think about how he could communicate the issues of energy uh, to the nation. And this was part of his platform uh, that he generated. Uh, but now we have such a wonderment of advancement and so just as I was leaving, uh, we had just finished the energy summit that brought ministers, ambassadors, and energy ministers from Africa, right in Houston, Texas, hosted by our mayor, Sylvester Turner. I'm not uh, uh, too far away from home to have you give our mayor of the city of Houston an applause uh, for um, that advancement. And let me be very clear, energy is broadly shared in many aspects. And so this room does not run away from climate change, it does not run away from solar, it does not run away uh, from wind, it does not run away from fossil, it does not run away from uh, all aspects of energy. And so that's why we thought this idea of the critical minerals would be a dynamic and unusual way of producing dialogue uh, about uh, this new component that deals with our national security, that deals with our energy security, that deals with our relationships around the world, and deals with our relationship with the continent of Africa that must be built. And as I look at my friends from the port, um, they are non-discriminators. And so if large ships came from Africa, they would be sitting there standing up applauding. And that's what I'm hoping to do. We have to build the economy for a continent that has such a wealth of resources uh, that should be utilized um, for the benefit of their citizens, but also in a nation like the United States that does business internationally in the right way with procedures and contracts and, and the fairness of the profits that would come for that company. So I'm delighted today to be joined um, by uh, Chris Wilmot uh, and I'm well as well to indicate that one of the components of this new uh, investment is CVMR, a project that we're looking to uh, ensure uh, to have a facility uh, at the port dealing with critical minerals. And so I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Wilma, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Glory Infrastructure Incorporated. Um, he has a prolific and ordinarily, extraordinarily successful career. He's currently involved as a strategic alliance partner with several major United States consulting, engineering, energy management, security operation firms, which include CVMR. We're delighted to have you, Chris, and welcome. I'll be introducing others as we come forward. And I'm happy to be here, and I want to offer my uh, appreciation to this concept of critical minerals. I had an opportunity to uh, uh, engage uh, the president of the uh, DRC um, in terms of uh, through uh, the various staff, and I know that he is committed uh, to this new journey for the DRC to begin to look to opportunities to work with the United States. Uh, we did a groundbreaking in Amarillo, Texas uh, to begin a construction of uh, a uh, project that was going to be good for the residents of Houston and uh, working with CBMR, standing up uh, another project to produce minerals pure enough to use in all forms of digital technology uh, imaginable. And I first began working for U.S. independence from foreign sources of critical minerals in uh, 2020, as I wrote to the then Secretary of Energy, Dan Brulette, uh, about securing uh, a private-public partnership investment or loan to produce products for use in the defense, electronics, pharmaceutical, aerospace, and automotive industries. It's important to note that these critical minerals can be used across the board. And that is an important point of our discussion today. CVMR has continued to impress me with their deep knowledge of critical minerals, uh, and uh, we're grateful that they provided information on uh, this issue in a congressional briefing in the Rayburn uh, building, which I was very excited about uh, having them there, and brought a whole delegation from Amarillo uh, to educate staff and members on this important step going forward. I'm also excited that we will soon announce 
250 new good paying jobs in the city of Houston in the 18th congressional district due to today's groundbreaking that we had, uh, the groundbreaking that we had in Amarillo. Um, and to look to in creating in that space and growth 500 to 1,000 jobs in Houston, but I'm not limiting to that across the nation coming to develop this industry of precious metals. And so I think it is particularly important that we acknowledge the Democratic Republic of the Congo and uh, would you give the Congo DRC and their president a very warm applause. <laughs> Serving on the Budget Committee I, in Homeland Security, I realize that energy and security are intertwined. And I also realize that many of you waited long months for a new car, no chips. Made it long months for a phone, no chips. Uh, and um, I can assure you uh, that we tried to explain to you about the chips. They tried to explain to the member about the chips, uh, but uh, none of us were hearing it because it was something that was uh, not familiar to us. Uh, and uh, what you would not imagine, it is a huge industry. It is a unbelievably costly but prosperous industry and that Africa, in particular the DRC, is a source for the world. Uh, and other nations have come, as they have done, to grab up uh, resources, but without the kind of diplomacy and humanity that the United States has. And also the amount of diversity that we have so that those who will be collaborating in business and the State Department would come from all walks of life. Uh, we believe that we have an opportunity uh, with our companies here in the United States uh, and Canada uh, to be able to do better. Um, for your uh, knowledge, these chips provide feed materials for 3D printing, additive ma manufacturing and metal injection molding, manufacturing graphite films on nickel or iron substrates using coal wall chem chemical vapor disposition from a mixture of hydrogen and methane manufacturing graphene and graphite from CO2, CH4, and anthracite, creating graphite flakes coated on embedded with nanometal, refining of lithium and chloride-based green, sulfite-based green, fossil green date deposits, clay deposits, and spodamine, producing refined elements of nanoflow cell. And so as your eyes roll back in your head, just know that you can immediately just use the terminology rear rare earth metals, rare earth metals. And my affection for this challenging effort is I can just imagine all of the jobs, all of the companies that can be spread across the nation in urban inner city communities where the youth of the 21st century who love technology can be right there at the table. That's my vision. I want this to be an industry taken over by the United States uh, I need not tell you what friend has been most dominant in Africa. Um, and um, we know that uh, countries have a right to visit, such as China, uh, and engage in business. But I do know that the business trends, tactics, collaboration from the United States can be a grand asset for all of us. So I am especially pleased that you will get to hear from the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The President was en route, was in, actually in uh, Belgium, uh, and a national security incident occurred. We all understand heads of state and the responsibilities that they have. And so this uh, national security incident uh, did occur. We wanted the President to be safe. We want the Congo to be safe. And so we have been uh, well suited to allow him to return to the DRC uh, so that uh, he could uh, handle those matters and provide us with his greetings, which you will hear in just a moment as I introduce uh, the president of the DRC um, since January 25th, 2019. He is a leader of the Union for Democracy and Social Progress, the DRC's oldest and largest party, succeeding his late family, late father, uh, President Etienne, in that role, a three-time Prime Minister of Zaire and opposition leader during the reign of Mobutu 
Sessi Sicko. Uh, the president was the UDPS party's candidate for president in December 2018 general election, which he was awarded um, despite uh, the uh, ups and downs, uh, he became president. The Constitutional Court upheld the victory uh, that uh, he engaged in. And so uh, since that time, uh, he has been seeking to diversify the Congo, to open it up for young people to not leave the Congo, the DRC, but to have opportunities. Mr. Ringo, you know what opportunities are all about. You know how you can match opportunities uh, in the continent and expand the access to young people. This is what this president wants to do. So we wish him well, and we now would like the video to roll uh, to be able to have the president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo present us now, Mr. Tishilombo. President. Mr. Secretary of State. Mr. Secretary of State, Mr. Secretary of Defense, Madam Secretary of Commerce, Ladies and gentlemen, and honorable members of the Black Caucus of the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I am particularly honored to respond today to the invitation sent to the Democratic Republic of Congo to take part to this conference of the Black Caucus of the Congress of the United States. I would like to thank the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee for her personal involvement in our participation to this conference. And I wish at the same time that my intervention in this day further illuminates the lantern of your August caucus on the issues related to my country. First of all, it is up to me to recall that the Democratic Republic of the Congo has always been a privileged partner of the United States and this officially since the 1960s, when it gained independence. But in reality, this strategic partnership dates back to colonial times. Indeed, the universal collective memory will forever retain that it is through the supply of its uranium ores to the alliance that the, Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is legitimately considered as an actor symbolically of the end of the World War II. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, strategic minerals, namely cobalt, germanium, coltan, and so many others that abound in the soil of the Democratic Republic of Congo, in addition to its forests and peat lands, essential to the sequestration of carbon dioxide on a large scale, meet both the needs of the modernization and the global imperative to combat ch climatic change. Okay. It is on the strength of this unique potential in the world that my country irrefutably positions itself as a solution country and nurtures the ambition to be one of the precursors of the first green industrial revolution. I would also add that as a country solution, in addition to its forests and peatlands, essential for large-scale CO2 sequestration, the Democratic Republic of Congo plans to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gases with the production in the 10 years to come of over 10 million tons of green hydrogen per year. This is the equivalent of what 27 countries of the European Union have set themselves to produce within the same time. Indeed, the recent studies affirm that to keep the rise of temperature below 1.8 Celsius in 2030, it is necessary that the world produces and consumes 100 million tons of green hydrogen in replacement of fossil fuels. My country alone will bring 10% of or even more of this global requirement. That is why I consider this Black Caucus Conference 
to be an opportunity to create a new pillar of cooperation in these strategic areas with a view to consolidating bilateral relations between the Democratic Republic of Congo and the United States. Indeed, it is not to be demonstrated that securing the chain, the supply of strategic minerals and in rare earth plays an important role in the economy and security of the United States. The potential of the DRC described above is therefore a challenge that is major for both of our countries. Because with more than $20 trillion of gross domestic product, America is capable of investing in all sectors of sustainable development that my country greatly needs. To do this, I would like to reassure you that over the past three years, my government has made very sustained efforts to meet the challenge of improving the business and investment climate. At the heart of these efforts, it is necessary to single out, among other things, the respect and promotion of human rights, the fight against anti-values including corruption, embezzlement of public funds, the promotion of entrepreneurship for young people and for women, the revitalization of the judiciary, and the restoration of state authority throughout the territory of our nation. These indicators that speak in favor of the commitment of American investments in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, far from being an expression of satisfaction, you will agree with me that highlighting the above efforts is intended to demonstrate our firm determination to offer investors wishing to come to our country and our economic partners an environment conducive to the creation of wealth in a win-win partnership. This is why it is important for all the partners of our country, the Democratic Republic of Congo in general, and the United States in particular, to support these efforts in all respects, more specifically in the fight for the restoration of peace, security, stabilization of the country and the institutions, therefore required conditions to promote and boost harmonious economic and social development for the benefit of the population and for investments. I'm convinced that the Black Caucus will all the symbolism it embodies for the history of Africa and America will contribute to the implementation of our common ambitions. Long live the American Congolese thank friendship. Thank you. Mr. President, we are so grateful uh, for this, uh, your statement, uh, and um, I won't um, uh, pretend uh, uh, to uh, give to the non-English speakers in the room all of the French that I would want to give to them today. Um, I will let the wonderful interpreter who did such an excellent job, uh, but I will see merci beaucoup. Uh, it is certainly wonderful for both you and the president. Thank you so very much. I hope you heard how pivotal these critical mi minerals are. So as I take my seat, let me uh, yield to uh, my co-moderator who will introduce uh, uh, some of the panelists. And once Mr. Wilmot, who we've already introduced, we know his great leadership and in his in international company, but what I would say to you that he is in Houston and Texas renowned as uh, an outstanding civic leader and civic citizen. He would always want me to say he's a man of faith as well. And so we are certainly uh, grateful for uh, his uh, wanting to establish the um, essence of security. Uh, when I begin again, you'll hear me say critical minerals just permeate much of our life. You'll hear that today. We hope you'll be engaged and we hope we'll have a moment or two for questions from all of you. So Mr. Wilmot, please, uh, you can uh, share at your seat um, as you desire with your mic and then we'll begin. Uh, we'll follow with our um, Assistant Secretary from the State Department, most closely aligned uh, to the President of the DRC. Thank you, Congresswoman. And it's, uh, it's my honor to 
at least brief you a little bit first, giving honor to God, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. This place is a place that we are about to have a chain between the United States and Africa. The key here is Africa is a place they have the natural resources that can transform the world. But the United States occasionally forget that their natural partners are the continent of Africa. First, let me thank the congresswoman for standing for the continent of Africa. And the natural fit between Africa and the United States is through the Congressional Black Caucus. And most people don't realize the fights that they have to go through to pass the African Growth and Opportunity Act in the year 2000, and the process that gave Africa the process to be able to share their equipment, their manufacturing stuff to the United States all by the efforts and leadership of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, one of the top 10 congressional leaders of all time in the United States Congress. <laughs> she, she worked tirelessly. See, two years ago we went in Africa. We went to Ghana to celebrate the return to the nation with the Speaker of the House and with her leadership, and the way they were able to try to get that project going, and from recent visit to Senegal, where we met the Africa Corp, and with the con continent's interest to transform the United States and Africa with the natural resources, especially in the Republic of Congo. With my friend Alexi Kayembe, Senior Vice President of the President of Congo, and Chikani, they tried and said, Chris, we need to see the critical minerals that we have, how we can let the United States and Africa, especially Congo, to be able to transform. When you, if you look at Tanzania, you look at other countries on the soil, you will see that Africa have so much to offer in the United States. We got the technology, second to none. Nowhere in the world have the technology that the United States, and nowhere have deep pockets than the United States. So it's a natural fit. Most of the folks that you see, African-American leadership, from the United States Congress, from the Congressional Black Caucus, are the ones that African leaders, when they come here, have to learn how to see them to get your things going. Going to different type of areas will not help you. And it is time we see the connection. African leadership need to know their natural partners and the people that can transform the critical minerals for the United States is Africa through our Congress uh, woman and the congressional delegation that happens to look like us. I went to a historically black university, Tuskegee University. And for those hearing on the stream, someone who has gone through can tell you the benefits that you get once you can see the vision that the congresswoman worked tirelessly to make things happen in the healthcare area where you need critical minerals, in the automobile area where you need critical minerals, in the computer and technology area where we need our chips. Everything has to come through the technology that people are looking has to come through critical minerals. And Africa has the critical minerals. So it's all it's bound upon us to be able to work strategically with the African continent, with the people that have the key and resources. And all I can say is, it's time we continue to work as a team to make up a difference globally. So Congresswoman, thank you for your tireless, especially your staff. They've been working tireless to make sure to put this program together, especially your chief of staff. Lily has just been tremendous and all the other staff members, but especially the vision that you have for Africa and not talk much about Houston. Most people don't realize that Houston is known as the energy capital of the world. But very soon, 
will also be known as the critical minerals part of the world. So ladies and gentlemen, the next time we hear the president is coming, we expect him to be in Houston because he was supposed to be at the port of Houston and we're supposed to bring him to Houston so we can make a difference. Thank you very much, Congressman. Because my colleagues are obviously interested, let me assure you this is a planting of the seed uh, for this to go all over America because Critical Minerals has the opportunity to, uh, once shipped to the United States, there can be many opportunities to engage because it is such a vital uh, source for such uh, a extended aspect of our work. Someone who knows about the work of the United States, who I've had the privilege of knowing uh, and know his trajectory of uh, commitment as a diplomat, which as I have traveled uh, in these recent months to Ukraine, um, to the uh, OSCE, uh, which deals with the interparliamentary exchange of countries from around the world, uh, as we have heard for many people Ukraine's name for the first time and now are wedded to the television as to how this may drive the world. And then of course his uh, work uh, in Greece, which is a strategic country as well, an ally of the United States, uh, with its own uh, governmental challenges uh, in the location that it is, uh, but we know it to be the place of Olympians. And now, of course, uh, in his role of dealing with energy resources, we couldn't think of a better person to articulate how all of this translates uh, into diplomacy, friendship, working with Africa, uh, than my dear friend Jeffrey Pyatt who is the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Energy Resources. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Th thank you so much, Congresswoman. And let me say thank you to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for inviting me. This is literally my very first public appearance in Washington, D.C. after confirmation. And I'm so honored, Congresswoman, <laughs> to be doing it under your chairmanship. Um, as you noted, I've gotten to know you in, in Ukraine and in Greece as a leading voice for an engaged foreign policy grounded in our values, committed to American leadership. But I will also say for the Houstonians here, um, as the new Assistant Secretary for Energy Resources, I have promised the Texas delegation that Houston will be one of my very first domestic destinations as Assistant Secretary, because I want to hear from American workers. I want to hear from American energy companies. And I was so glad to s hear the Congresswoman make the point about energy transition. Because as Houstonians know, if you look back over 100 years, energy and fossil fuels have been central to American power around the world. And Houston has been a center of that story. My mission and my commitment as Assistant Secretary is to ensure that for this next era of energy, as we move from fossil fuels to renewable sources, and as we accelerate this energy transition, that the United States maintains that leadership position against our adversaries, and we don't have to say who they are, and that the American, the American skill for innovation, American technology, American capital, American workers are central to that story. Um, the Biden-Harris administration is, as you all know, deeply committed to the process of energy transition for reasons of climate and sustainability, but also for economic competitiveness. And I'm convinced that we are going to see a rapid acceleration of that process now, thanks in large part to the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, which is going to supercharge the clean energy industry in the United States and is going to significantly accelerate demand for the critical minerals that the Congresswoman alluded to. Minerals like cobalt, lithium, nickel, and rare earths. I'm just making the point that an electric vehicle requires four times the mineral inputs of a conventionally fueled vehicle. Um, not to mention the demand that will come from more wind power, more solar, the expansion of the electric grid, and not just in the United States, but globally, where we are committed to accelerating the process of energy transition and making sure that this transition and the deployment of these technologies happens as fast as possible. 
I will only make one other point today, Congresswoman, and that is to refer to a meeting that I had the honor to participate in a week ago today at the UN General Assembly in New York. This was a meeting of the Mineral Security Partnership, a group of 19 countries from around the world, which were convoked by Secretary of State Blinken, um, Under Secretary for Economic Affairs, Jose Fernandez, and your friend and my friend, XM Chair Rita Jo Lewis. Um, we were very proud to have five African countries represented in that conversation, uh, including DRC, but also Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, and Zambia. And all of us came together to talk about how we can jointly ensure the sustainable exploitation of these mineral resources around the world, whether in Latin America, Africa, Asia, or here in North America, but also how to ensure the sustainability of our efforts. And it was so striking to me. We had 19 countries, ranging from the United States and Korea, highly developed countries, to much less developed countries. There was no finger pointing. Everybody spoke in terms of sustainability, in terms of joint interests, and in terms of economic opportunity. And I will just conclude by noting, and this made me very proud, I spoke on the margins of this event with the Tanzanian foreign minister, uh, Minister Mulamama. And she said to me, she said, um, she said, thank you so much to the United States for bringing us all together. We've rarely heard from the United States on these issues of mining and critical minerals and sustainability, but now you are in the room. We're delighted to have you here, and we look forward to working with you. And I think that's exactly the right note on which to conclude my remarks. Um, and also in the spirit of Congresswoman, your point that this is not an end point, but rather the starting point of an important and sustained dialogue. And certainly for the State Department, for my boss, Secretary Blinken and our team, we are deeply committed to partnering with you to ensure that America continues to lead the way. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate you very much. And we're delighted to be the first stop that you made uh, outside the State Department. Let me uh, thank you so very much. Mr. Brad Cap Crabtree is Assistant Secretary for Department of Energy, Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. He leads and directs FECM's research um, and uh, development programs and oversees the Office of Petroleum Reserves. He brings nearly three decades of experience uh, in energy and climate policy to his role as Assistant Secretary. And prior to coming to DOE, serves as Vice President at the Great Plains Institute and co-founded Director of Carbon Capture Coalition. He knows what it means to move into the 21st century, reduce emissions, and guide the United States uh, Department of Energy as the outstanding Secretary of Energy has done, and she's done an outstanding job. Please convey to her our greetings as well. Uh, Secretary Crabtree, you are on, and uh, we are moving swiftly. Uh, so um, we're asking um, for you to uh, present your uh, very vital information uh, in a, um, a wonderful time frame. <laughs> if, thank, uh, thank I'm you. using diplomacy. <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman, and it's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation, and in the spirit of your guidance, um, my colleague at the State Department, Assistant Secretary Pyatt, shared some perspective that is very similar to what I would have said about the international context, but let me just say one thing on that front, because the timing for me is, it's, uh, was when I got your invitation, was uh, really impeccable, because I'm leaving tomorrow for South Africa, and... <laughs> And I'll be attending Africa Oil and Gas Week, which is an opportunity for leadership from around Africa to gather. And not only will we be talking about clean energy and industrial development associated with energy, we're also going to be talking about critical minerals. And after that, I'm going to Mozambique. Uh, the Assistant Secretary mentioned Mozambique, uh, and we'll be talking about critical minerals there as well. So I'm excited about that. Maybe let me just say that in addition to partnering with Africa, uh, we also need to do our part here at home. Uh, we are deeply vulnerable uh, in terms of our dependence on other countries for critical minerals and rare earth elements, but not just on the supply. We also lack that we, we basically outsourced and deindustrialized our capacity to process those minerals. So we have a two-pronged effort at the Department of Energy, thanks to the infrastructure bill that others have mentioned, where we can invest in the development of our own critical minerals resources. Uh, and in the processing capacity. I'll just very briefly talk a little bit about that. Um, 
we have invested uh, nearly $20 million in characterizing critical mineral, uh, critical mineral resources, rare earth elements in multiple locations around the country. We have teams working right now with resources from the infrastructure bill to determine the nature of those resources, the opportunity for new technology to extract them. The interesting thing is we're looking at a lot of waste streams, not just new mining, but actual waste streams. So things like coal ash, acid mine drainage, uh, um, mine tailings, uh, produced water from oil and gas are all sources for critical minerals. The exciting thing here is not only do we produce the minerals we need, but we have the potential to remediate a lot of these legacy wastes that burden communities around the country. So it's a real win-win. Um, but obviously we can't do this alone. Uh, we need to be sourcing minerals for building our clean energy industrial economy from other countries, as the Assistant Secretary said. And Africa is a, a vital opportunity and, uh, uh, for us to accomplish that and to partner. Um, I would just note that one thing on the demand, uh, we're looking at uh, potentially increases of four to 600 percent in the demand for many of these resources. Uh, Assistant Secretary Pyatt is right. The Inflation Reduction Act will supercharge demand for those resources. Uh, and the federal funding in the infrastructure bill will help give us the capacity to invest in new technology and development of the production and processing capabilities that we need, whether it's our own domestic minerals we produce or those we might receive from countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Uh, and again, just appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to the discussion. A true plum, which is the uh, critical minerals in the DRC are needed uh, in our efforts in energy, and um, you made the connectedness that I think is so very important. So thank you so very much, Assistant Secretary, and thank you for your presence here today. It's my pleasure to now introduce the Director of Critical Minerals Institute, Department of Energy. Uh, Mr. LaGracio uh, has a long history as a MSE adjunct professor uh, and as well uh, he is the director of the U.S. Department of Energy's um, interim of the Ames Laboratory. And I know the laboratories, having been on the Science Committee, are very crucial to our research. It is very important to know that he is a B.S. and M.S. and a Ph.D. Uh, in medical-allergical engineering from Michigan Technological University. And he serves as a scientist. And so with his affirmation, we know we're on the right track because he is a scientist who says, Get those critical minerals now. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. And thank you to the uh, Black Caucus Foundation for giving me this opportunity. I do need to make a correction. It's a very happy one. I am not the interim director of the Ames National Laboratory. I, I was, but we have a, Adam Schwartz is our director at the moment. So The only thing I will say is that you were. I was, yes. yes. So you were truly a scientist. You headed a lab. That's correct. All right. Yeah. So, um, thank you. You know, it's true that we are going to need large, large quantities to realize this vision of clean energy transition for rare earth and rare earth magnets, as well as for the battery materials for the electric vehicles and for, for the generation of electricity, uh, renewable sources in particular wind energy. Permanent magnets are the most efficient way to convert mechanical motion to electricity or vice versa, electricity to mechanical. And we want to be able to use the energy we create in the most efficient manner. So I can't stress how important these materials are for a clean energy transition. The large amount of material uh, sometimes as many as 42 times the amount of lithium that we use today will be needed in the next five to ten years. We cannot just go after and create these materials. We do not have to destroy our environment to do so. We need better innovative ways to extract these materials from the ground, 
process them, and turn them into useful functional materials. And that's what the Critical Materials Institute has done and continues to do. We try to unlock new sources, whether it's uh, geologic ores or unconventional sources like mine tailings, like um, uh, byproducts from other types of production. Phosphogypsum, fertilizer production in Florida, has significant rare earth content. Produced waters from oil and gas has significant lithium. And so we want to extract those materials and process them in ways that do not destroy our environment. So we want to develop better molecules that can go in, extract those materials, whether it be from rock or from produced waters, and do it in a way that uses less energy, less chemicals, and more environmentally friendly chemicals. We concentrate on both these primary sources, secondary sources, and recycled sources. I think we've neglected our recycling capabilities in this nation. We've developed an acid-free solution to extract rare earth metals from all of your electronic devices. It goes in, it pulls the rare earths out, it doesn't touch anything else, leaves the rest of the e-waste to be processed as it currently is to recycle the aluminum, the platinum group metals, and, um, and, and it leaves no footprint behind because it is basically aqueous based and we recycle that water back in to the process. So the challenges going forward are reduce chemicals, reduce energy, and better water management. Most of these materials are found in places that are arid, and damage to the water has been a long history for the mining industry. We need better ways to do that. So um, the Institute tries to focus on these things, and and really the sustainable aspects of acquiring the materials we need. And it's not just domestically, of course, it's worldwide. Mother Nature has put the minerals where, they, where she has, and we want to make sure we don't destroy any part of this planet as we acquire the materials that are needed. And I, that will conclude my remarks. Thank you. We're so pleased to have a scientist and to give the aspect of clean mining uh, and what happens when you have to mine these minerals. Uh, and I'm delighted that you're at the Department of Energy to give guidance uh, and support to the President's mission as well. So thank you so very much. Um, I'm even more excited now to uh, have the President of Eagle Tech um, to uh, make a presentation. Um, we're delighted uh, when Dr. Pandwe Gibson confirmed uh, she makes going green cool, high-tech, uh, and profitable. Uh, she has a, a mastery of credentials that I'm going to actually read, but I am going to say this. She has started, led, and scaled more than 20 successful companies. She is a conglomerate in her own right, but she has a Bachelor of Arts from Scripps College, a Master from uh, Claremont Graduate University, a Master in Leadership from Harvard Graduate School, an MBA from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a PhD from Claremont Graduate University. And she has lived and studied and worked internationally, of course, uh, in uh, uh, the University of Legon in Accra, Ghana, Oxford, uh, in Oxford, England. We're delighted to have uh, the president of Ecotech, uh, Dr. Gibson. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for having me on the panel, Congresswoman, and to everybody else, and to all the participants, and to the president of the DRC. Um, I want to take a minute to uh, talk about the opportunities for rare earth minerals from three different standpoints. One in ECHO and two areas that haven't been mentioned yet. So first, around refinement and processing. It's already been mentioned that there's sort of two areas to address that from from extraction of the minerals, which would be mostly about the partnership with the DRC, um, really thinking about the opportunities with that. In order for that to move forward, because I want to sort of bring some solutions to the table, um, there are regulations in the loan process for 
um, NGOs and or new companies that want to start up that make it difficult for the purchasing of the equipment that's necessary for refinement. So our government sort of addressing some of those regulations so that equipment can be purchased, whether it be loans through the IMF or the World Bank, et cetera, so companies can sort of develop out their refinement processes. Um, and the same thing in the U.S. as we're talking about um, moving forward technology specifically around R&D of taking waste, sort of that trash to treasure model, um, figuring out ways to sort of increase commercialization for companies to um, take that technology. I personally, my company has a partnership with the Department of Energy already um, and MIT in terms of tech transfer. And so making that more available to companies, startups, entrepreneurs, particularly since the Congresswoman mentioned the interest in bringing it to urban centers and creating opportunities there. Creating opportunities in the commercialization space would make it more available for more people um, to access the refinement plant building framework. The other area is logistics and providence technology. So uh, the president of the DRC mentioned that um, they've taken major strides to make sure that the Congo doesn't have some of the issues that South Africa had in mining diamonds, et cetera, um, in terms of creating um, safety and security throughout the supply chain. My work is very much in figuring out how to shrink the supply chain, not just taking out members in that chain, but also thinking about providence in the process. There are a number of American companies that are working on that, particularly blockchain technology is built for this, right? The distributive letter, ledger creates significant opportunities to sort of uh, make sure that everybody in the process is who should be there and that payments go out to the correct people in the process um, so that the people who are actually doing the mining, if we're talking about mining, are getting access to um, profit from their work. The people who are doing the production are getting access to proper payment for that work um, and so on and so forth down the supply chain. And then the final area being education. Um, which I think is super critical to this conversation because part of why um, China has been able to take hold is because of what they're able to pay workers, but also the significant investment they made in educating their population about a decade ago to be able to work in refinement plants and technology, as you mentioned, part of that's part of my background. And so if we're going to look at both U.S. and DRC or any international partnerships as it relates to um, rare earth mineral production, there has to be a significant investment in, investment in education. Um, I do have a foundation, and my foundation actually provides um, green tech training for entrepreneurs, but also just for um, regular citizens who want to upskill, and we partner with major companies within the solar field to provide people with access. And if there is an opportunity to develop both NGOs in the Congo or whatever country we're partnering with and in the U.S. that can focus on that sort of upskill training, um, because if we could reduce the cost uh, we can reduce the cost by increasing the amount of people who have the skill to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And uh, we hope you'll be a resource for uh, not only the work going forward, but a resource as well for this audience. Uh, let's give her, Dr. Gibson, another applause of kindness she took the time to make the presentation. Um, as we close, I want to make sure that we acknowledge Kamran Kozen, who is the chairman and CEO of CVMR. Would you please stand? so that we can see you and uh, we'll also have you as a resource and uh, making a presentation going forward. I think I spoke extensively about your work uh, and we're gratified that you'll be in Houston uh, as you're in Amarillo, but you'll be around the world uh, because uh, you have a vital, vital um, strategy, technology, and commitment to the critical metals. Thank you so very much. Give him a hand, please. That's Mr. Kamran Kozen and we thank you so very much. We're going to finish, um, and we are finishing, uh, with um, our friend, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Bureau of African Affairs, Secretary of State Irvin Masinga. And I wanted Mr. Masinga to come uh, because I wanted him to give the crowning uh, two minutes to the idea of Africa and the riches of its resources, its vitality uh, as a uh, continent and an ally 
many of the countries, 53, we might have gone up one, uh, but in any event, how important their alliance is. And so the work with critical metals and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, if you could give us just a minute or two, we greatly appreciate your presence here. And I'm grateful for uh, your assistant staff person, uh, Nicholas Johnson, who has been so effective in helping us today. Glad that he is here. Mr. Masinga, you're on. Thank you so much, um, Congressman. Thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, address this group and be part of this panel. Um, to your point, the Secretary of State went to Africa just recently in August, went to South Africa, announced our new strategy to Africa, and then went to the DRC immediately thereafter, knowing full well the importance of the DRC um, in so many ways to advance our policy towards Africa across a, a multitude of domains, including the issue of critical minerals. So it was a wise choice to invite uh, President Chisichetti today to offer his views and his vision of how the DRC can be part of a clean energy future that we all aspire to. Let me talk a little bit about how the DRC uh, fits into our strategy and what we're doing to advance our mutual interests with uh, the DRC as it represents uh, all of Africa. Um, on the issue of governance and democracy, uh, the DRC is moving ahead with elections scheduled for next year. Uh, the United States has invested a tremendous amount of our resources on our political capital and our diplomatic efforts to ensure that the people of the DRC are able to have the kinds of elections that they know will be essential for that country to have the kind of stability going forward. So we're looking forward to that and we will partner with the people of the DRC um, in the months ahead. Uh, we also know that the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the region are suffering uh, under uh, uh, conflict that you find in Eastern DRC. And without resolution in that matter, that the vision that we all have today will be greatly undermined. So our diplomacy is directed at finding ways on a regional basis to address that and hopefully end that, that cruel conflict was, which has affected so many people so, for so very long. Uh, specifically, we're working with our friends in Kenya under the so-called Nairobi process to address that. Um, again, going back to governance, the issue of transparency and encouraging ways for the people of uh, the Deep Democratic Republic of Congo and all of Africa, really, to enjoy the fruits of this sort of development in a transparent fashion is essential for creating the foundation for uh, prosperity globally and certainly for Africa. And if I make, make a plug, uh, we will see you and uh, President Chisichetti right here at the Convention Center here in Washington in December for the Africa Leader Summit, uh, 13 through 15. Mark your calendars. I'm going to have a special seat for that conference. This is outstanding uh, that we have had this session. Uh, we are timely and appropriate, and we're going to see if we can squeeze in this dynamic singer from Africa. You never thought energy and uh, diplomacy goes together. Abia uh, Koa, uh, if the lights remain on, you can run to this podium as quickly as you can uh, to show that we mean business when we talk about critical metals, uh, and we talk about diplomacy, we talk about culture, we talk about art. Thank you so very much, and I'm praying for the extension so this audience can hear the beauty of your voice. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Mama. My name is Abi Koya. I'm Nigerian. Singing okay. first. Um, so I'd like to sing a beautiful song that you all know, and I hope it makes you, um, it makes your day. Hey, to voice, hey, to voice. Every morning you greet me, small and white, clean and bright. You look happy to meet me, blossom of snow, may you bloom and grow. Bloom on grow forever, Africa, Africa, bless my homeland forever. 
Thank you so very much. God bless USA. God bless Africa. Let me um, just say that I'm delighted to have had all of you here for this very critical session. The energy depends on exploration, extracting, uh, and processing and delivering critical metals. The transition from fossil fuels to low carbon energy sources will depend on critical minerals. And from a beautiful voice to critical minerals, to all that you've said today, we're very grateful for your presence. My moderator, co-moderator, wants to give you a final word. To each of you, let me thank you to uh, Dr. Gibson, Mr. Masinga. Uh, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Crabtree, Director LaGracio, and Assistant Secretary Patrick. Thank you so very much. And to the moderator, co-moderator. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, you know, the President's Special Advisor is sitting right here, Alexi Kambi. Uh, Alexi. Also, Congresswoman, there are several people who have made this thing happen. We have, uh, you already introduced Cam Cameron, if you, uh, Chip, Brittany, Tom. These are all the critical minerals folks. You have Michael and the team from the Port of Houston. Uh, they were going to host the president with your uh, presence in your 18th congressional district at the Port of Houston because, as I told you, Houston is known as the energy capital of the world. The next thing we're going to do, so you need to tell President Tsimbi in Congo that the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make Congo a sister and connected city of Houston. Because the congressman district is the downtown of Houston. I used to chair the Convention of Business Bureau. At the time, it was 260 billion GDP when I took over. When I moved to the Greater Houston Partnership as chairman of the World Trade, it was 450 billion. So that tells you Houston is the place to do business. So ladies and gentlemen, we thank our congressman for making a big difference around the globe. Congressman, thank you for being a great court moderator and keep fighting for the people of Houston and the people around the globe. But we need President Biden to commit to go to Africa because we went to Africa with President Clinton. Then we followed with her in the White House with President Bush. Then President Obama. Now we need President Biden to make a commitment to the African-American community seeing my sister Donnie here that we are going to, by the hook or crook, take him because his base is the African American community. And since we have the critical minerals, he needs to come with the 50 billion investment that he just made with the critical mineral investment for the CHIP Act, which the congressman worked so tirelessly. Let's take advantage, not only from the congressman's perspective, but from the perspective of African Americans. Thank you very much. I told you he was a man of faith. Good to see you, Duny Hebram. The president is going to go to Africa. I know that. I know what's in his heart. And he heard you, Mr. Wilmot, I think all the way at 1600 Pennsylvania. I know the president's heart and the first lady's heart. I can see them taking off in the near future. But I'm delighted. Thank you so very much. My greetings to Senator uh, Secretary Blinken. And I know that if the president is in Africa, he will be and many others will go with him. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will provide these uh, wonderful panelists as resource persons if you have questions. Delighted that the Houston Port is here. Don't want this to be a Houston, Houston, but we're delighted that the nation is in the room uh, and um, uh, Ohio is in the room. I couldn't see um, a new member of the board of API, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you so very much and uh, with your great uh, support that we have. Again, we appreciate it all over the nation. Critical minerals is gonna make a difference, clean energy, it's going to make a difference. Thank you, and thank you to the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who made every effort to be here by video with his wonderful uh, solicitation and information to a partnership and uh, increased relationship between the United States and, of course, uh, the DRC. Thank you, Alexei, for your leadership and service. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now conclude with the generosity and the extension that was given to us by our wonderful Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. We thank them so very much, and thank you for being here. Take care.